I've been thinking and writing this week about the extraordinary events in Scotland, and in particular about the underlying political atmosphere in the country and what it means for devolution and the political settlement. And I've been taking as my text something said by the late great Marxist thinker Tom Nairn, who said that in his view, Scotland would only be reborn when the last minister had been strangled by the last copy of the Sunday Post. Now, like many newspapers around the UK, the Sunday Post has been having a hard time of late. Circulation is down to around 37,000 and still dropping. Nonetheless, everywhere on newsstands and in newsagents around Scotland, it is still there. Now, as for the Church of Scotland, again, like most established Western churches across Europe, it is in sharp decline. A quarter of a century ago, about a million Scots, one in five, said they identified with the Church of Scotland. That's the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. Now the numbers uh, of attenders are something like 280,000, and they're down to around 650 ministers. But again, it is very much still there. Go to any city centre or small town or village and look around, and you'll see the Church of Scotland still robustly present. You might, if you go to the corner shop, bump into a minister. And so, from Tom Nairn's point of view, there is still a long way to go before the last minister is strangled with the last copy of the Sunday Post. But, of course, Tom Nairn was making a much wider point, and that was that Scotland, whatever the elite politics of independence and devolution and the parliament and all of that, was fundamentally a socially conservative society. Formed that way after centuries of Presbyterian religion, very, very strong influence of the Kirk all across the country and the importance of education for religious purposes, um, and also, like most of the rest of the country, a relatively conservative mainstream media. That was the point he was making. And in many ways, that remains true. Scottish middle-class opinion is not particularly more virtuous or hyper-liberal than middle-class opinion in Wales or in the south of England or anywhere else in these islands. And that is the fundamental truth that I think this week, in the huge political crisis following the resignation of the former First Minister Humza Yusuf after the collapse of the SNP Scottish Green alliance, the so-called Butte House Agreement, that is really the truth that the SNP is now facing. I've concluded that repairing our relationship across the political divide can only be done with someone else at the helm. Because what I think happened is that alliance with the Greens drove the SNP into positions, if you like, more virtuous, more hyper-liberal than Scottish public opinion was ready for. On trans rights, on the reaction to the CAS report and puberty blockers, on the hate crime bill, which is very, very hard line, on the bottle return scheme, which didn't work, on the new marine conservation areas, again, in many ways, a good idea, but not taking account of the views and the needs of Scottish fishing communities and big changes to the Scottish legal system. The end of juries in rape trials, for instance, the end of the non-proven verdict, something that Scots have been rather proud of as a signal of the difference and the distinction between Scottish legal traditions, very, very different from English ones. And this is the fundamental truth in many ways that the SNP is now having to grapple with, because after the August 2021 Butte House Agreement, it's aligned with the Scottish Green Party has driven it to positions which are well to the liberal left of many of its own supporters. Or, as one leading SNP figure told me this week, well to the liberal left, much more important, of Scottish public opinion. And so I don't see this so much as a crisis for Scottish devolution. I see it much more as a crisis for the Scottish National Party. And that name itself gives a clue to what's going wrong. Because we call them the Scottish Nationalists. But it is not the Scottish Nationalist Party, it is the Scottish National Party. And underpinning that is this belief, I think a very, very dangerous one, that the SNP, because of its cause of independence and freedom and democracy, sweeps in everybody, almost, in Scotland. It is the party which represents not just one faction of the country, but all of Scotland. And that is an incredibly dangerous delusion. Why? Because its real electorate encompasses such a huge range of opinion. You know, when I was uh, first aware of the SNP, then there were an awful lot of kind of heavily tweeted men with kind of 
Huge amounts of facial hair and briar pipes surrounded in smoke who would talk endlessly about William Wallace and the dangers of Romanism and Irish Romanism coming into Scotland, who were frankly highly bigoted, very, very reactionary and fervent for the SNP. Now, most of these people have long gone to their graves, but there is still within the SNP family, if I can put it this way, people of strongly conservative or, you might say, reactionary views. I think any party which, in its soul comes to believe that it represents the entire national family, is in trouble and is dangerous. And that has been true of the British Conservative Party and even of the British Labour Party during those periods when it has been feeling complacently invulnerable. Now, if you turn back to the SNP, this view that it represents everybody has led it at times into very, very different positions. It's had very, very famous Marxist cheerleaders like Hugh McDermott, the poet, and many others. And at the same time, it has been, for some of its history, bigoted and intolerant towards Catholics in Scotland and, in fact, towards Irish migrants into Scotland. It's contained both positions. And it was only really under Alex Salmond, when he was leader of the SNP, that it eradicated for good that Presbyterian or Protestant intolerance. Um, so who is the SNP, really? Is it, um, as the, the Marxist supporters would indicate, a party really of the left, or is it the party which voted down Jim Callaghan's Labour government in 1979 and ushered in the years of Thatcherism? It hasn't ever quite made up its mind. And that sort of existential question about who are we? We are not the party of all Scotland, so who are we really beyond the independence question is what's at the heart of what's going on now. I think over the last few years what's happened is that because the SNP has not been able to find the route towards a second independence referendum that is both legal and therefore will be accepted internationally, including in the EU, but can't be stopped by Westminster. They are down a blind alley constitutionally, and so they have been pushing themselves more and more onto these social issues and more and more onto fundamental mainstream governmental issues where they haven't done very well, certainly in education and health and in other areas. So this idea that they were a uniquely virtuous party, this was going to be the country where it was better than anywhere else in Europe to grow up as a child. This was going to be the party which was more socially equal than anywhere else in Europe. That's beginning to fall apart uh, under the pressure of reality. Uh, if you keep raising taxes, it's too easy in a single state, speaking a single language, for people simply to hop across the border. There are lots of big problems there for the SNP in terms of the economy, which they have not resolved. So clearly, the SNP has to decide further who it really is and what it really wants to do while the constitutional issue continues to simmer over to one side of the room. Now, some people are saying this all means that devolution has failed. The Scottish Parliament has failed and by implication should be wound up and abolished, as it was, of course, in 1707. Now, this is no more logical. Uh, the Scottish Parliament has only had 25 years, but it's no more logical than saying that because of what Liz Truss got up to, because of the disgraceful episodes around Boris Johnson, that the Westminster Parliament has failed and should therefore be abolished, presumably in favour of Brussels or somewhere else. It is a completely illogical position. If you believe in democracy, then you believe that democracy heals itself. It causes problems and then it resolves those problems. And that, I think, is what is going on inside the SNP right now, a really, really interesting, very important leadership contest ahead of us. I hope it isn't a stitch up. Um, but that is what democracy does. I don't believe these are the mortal dying pains of the Scottish Parliament. I believe these are simply part of the growing pains. Now, growing pains, as we all know, can be bloody painful. But this too will pass. Thank you for watching. I would really love to know what you think. So please, if you can, leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe so that you can get videos from the New Statesman as soon as they're released.